Welcome everybody to the 6 p.m. council meeting of March 15th, 2022. Let the roll call reflect that all council members are present. First item on the agenda is opening ceremony. I'll defer pledge of allegiance to Vice Chair Lopez. Uh, please rise and re repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Please consider joining us for a moment of silence. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is acknowledgements. We're joined today by Sharday Jones, a commissioner from the Diversity Commission. She'll be giving a presentation today on uh, Women's History Month and highlighting some movers and shakers in Ogden. Hi. Hi. All right, thanks for having us. Um, we have some awesome women behind us that we're gonna be recognizing today. Um, just getting started, yeah. All right, so in honor of Women's History Month, the Ogden City Council would like to recognize women making history her story right here in Ogden. The group embodies leadership, business acumen, compassion, problem solving, and community. They work in healthcare, education, arts, social services, and self-care. So we do have some of those ladies um, joining us via Zoom. I don't know if we can see them. Do you know if they're both on? Or did CJ go? Okay. So first we're going to be recognizing Latanya Jackson and Demia Gordon. Um, they are co-owners of Lamia Beauty Lounge. Um, in addition to running a successful salon with Demia, Latanya started the Butterfly Coils Project in 2017. The, but the Butterfly Coils Project has helped numerous families within the state of Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming to educate and empower families with children of color by providing the tools and knowledge they need to love and confidently care for their natural hair. The program offers in-salon parent look and learn sessions, natural hair care workshops, webinars, and group classes. It now has digital resources for families nationwide with an ebook online and digital course. They have partnered with Curly Me and the University of Utah's Lifelong Learning Program. So let's honor Latonya Jackson and Demia Gordon for Lamia Beauty Lounge. Okay, the next lady up on our agenda is Bess um, Dennison. She's from the Ogden School for the Deaf and the Blind, and she's a youth educator. Um, Elizabeth Dennison is a teacher of the blind and visually impaired with 45 years of experience working with young children with visual impairments. She received her master's in education of the blind and visually impaired from the University of Northern Colorado. She considers herself a practitioner at heart and has a passion for her work. Elizabeth, also known as Beth, Beth drives down from Logan to Ogden frequently to host toddler groups for the School for the Blind and Parent Infant Program. She also conducts home visits in the Ogden and Cache Valley areas um, via Zoom calls and, using, and uses her expertise to guide children and parents in navigating life with the vision and hearing impaired at an early age. Bess is creative and brilliant, bringing love and intention to each individual child, family and professional in her work. In addition, she continues to train individuals in Ogden, Utah and across the county um, and across the country to work with these blind and their family, as well as develop curriculum and training programs in this field um, through her work at the, oh my goodness, at the Ski High Institute at Utah State University. So let's give a round of applause for Bess. Okay, next we'll be honor honoring um, Yoshin Kobabe, IHC Home Care and Pediatrics Physical Therapy. 
Um, Yo Young Shin Kobabe, originally from Korea, holds a doctorate in physical therapy and works in early intervention physical therapy in Texas for several years. She moved to Utah and has been working for Intermountain Healthcare in pediatrics, changing the lives of children um, in Ogden and Northern Utah. Young Shin has an um, ardent love for her job and deep passion for how she cares for her children, showing up every day and always planning for how she'll care for her patients um, in and outside of her work. Um, she is a phenomenal healthcare provider, professional, and leader in the Ogden, and she is lucky, and we are lucky to benefit from her expertise and live um, in love of her profession. Sorry, my contacts are so dry. <laughs> it's been a long day. So let's give it up for Young Shin. Okay, next up we will be honoring Margaret Rose, um, YCC Executive Director. For the past three years, Margaret has been an Executive Director of the YCC Family Crisis Center, which supports individuals and families impacted by domestic and sexual violence through safety, advocacy, and resources on their journey to safe and healthy lives. Margaret genuinely cares for her 60 plus staff members and helped create a healthy work culture. She increased wages and ensured a safe work environment during the pandemic. Through her leadership at the YCC, um, through her leadership, YCC was able to continue to offer critical shelter services in person, switched to online classes where applicable, and kept the doors open. During this time, Margaret had the foresight to expand YCC by adding a development department of diversity or to diversity and grow sustainable funding sources and raise awareness for their programs and services through digital marketing, public relations, and community outreach. She is a great addition to the Ogden Civil Society. Let's give it up for Margaret. You guys are so awesome. This is so cool. Okay. Okay, next we have Christina Miller. Um, she's a conference and event content, content organizer and artist in the Ogden resident. Um, Christina shares her abundant talents as a professional corporate event manager with community of with in the community of Ogden. She is dedicated Ogdenite. Christina serves on the board of Next and symbol where which she helps bring music to Ogden and help manage um, poet flow in the Lighthouse Lounge. Um, her blogs about Ogden have been published in the Standard Examiner, the Ogden Source, and the Indie Ogden. She can be seen daily at the local coffee shops at um, Cafe Mercantile, shopping all the Ogden art shows and events, and supporting Ogden's local bars through the karaoke nights. <laughs> Christina brings the spirit of joy, activism, and togetherness in everything she does here in Ogden. Let's give it up for Christina. Okay, last but not least, we have Audrey Christensen. She's an entrepreneur, an artist, and a creative coach. Um, in Ogden local, Audrey has motivated, inspired, and mentored many local Ogden artists. She is a business coach for creative and queer artists and homeschooling mama. She, found, she founded the Markers Huddle, the, back, the Backyard Art Market, the Yard Cell, and works with Ogden, and works with the Ogden Bazaar. Let's give it up for Audrey. Okay. 
here, one, two, three. Charday, I think you set the tone. That was uh, acknowledgments is a new thing for us. Thanks, <laughs> thanks to some feedback we got from the diversity commission, and you set the tone and just knocked it out of the park. So, good luck to whoever follows that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any uh, comments or questions from council members? I'd be happy to make a comment. Sure. Yeah, just really, I really appreciate that presentation, Chardé, and I appreciate all the wonderful women that were celebrated, among many others in our community, too. I just have another quick comment, and, and that is, is I'm wondering what's going on outside of the chamber, because all the cool women are in this room tonight. <laughs> so, yeah. so thank you for everything that you guys are doing. Thanks. Mr. Chair, can I make a comment? Oh, yeah, please. Like you, being the father of daughters, we really appreciate strong women in leadership in our community, and thank you all for everything that you're doing. It's, it's inspiring for my kids, it's inspiring for me, and that's part of the reason that we, we live here, because so many people do so many amazing things. So thank you all very much for what you do. Thank you for honoring us and acknowledging our work. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Chair, I, what, what else could I say other than what's already been said, other, other than I'm just so proud to be here and to be able to be a part of uh, this really cool event. And again, anytime anyone brings that kind of energy and makes us laugh, it's just, you just made our day, so thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, anytime we can have fun on a Tuesday night, we're all for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's infrequent, we'll admit. But, yeah, you're not just setting the tone for this new thing. You set the tone for a lot of girls in our community, too. Awesome. Um, future women awesome. leaders, so. Yes, you guys are awesome. Yeah, feel free to stick around. We got minutes to approve. I mean... <laughs> Tons and tons of Tuesday night fun. So he got it. He said, Let's get out of here. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> Once we run for city council, we'll join Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, approval of minutes, a regular meeting of June 15th, 2021. Councilmember Chaburka? Um, yes, Chair. I've read those minutes and they're accurate to my recollection. Work session of June 22nd, 2021. Councilmember Hire. Chair, I have reviewed those and found them to be accurate uh, and make a motion that we uh, approve the, uh, the minutes that have been listed in the agenda. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Heyer, second by Council Member White to approve the minutes. This is a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Thank you for that. Two items on common consent, the fiscal year 2023 budget goals and guidelines and the FY23 financial principles. Chair, I would make a motion that we adopt the items in the common consent as part of our agenda as they are listed. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Heyer, second by Council Member Chaburka to adopt the items in common consent. This also is a, this is a roll call vote because of the Revolution. financial principles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Council Member Blair? Aye. Council Member Chaburka? Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Councilmember Ritchie? Aye. Councilmember White? Aye. Vice Chair Lopez? Aye. Chair Nadolsky? Aye. That passes. If we ever wonder how important our staff is, they make everything easy for us. They're like <laughs> big, bold red letters. Ben, don't forget. <laughs> so thank you for that. 
Okay, next item, unfinished business. Bring up Greg Montgomery to discuss the proposed rezone at 25th Street and Porter Avenue. Welcome back, Greg, thank you. Welcome, speaking of fun at City Council, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you just made us laugh. <laughs> Great. Uh, uh, Council, this is an item that you had tabled uh, from a meeting in February to uh, look at noticing, and I know in the work session last week, was it last week or two weeks ago, uh, that was discussed of the noticing procedures that took place. And uh, since that time, the developers also looked at some revisions to their plans to address some of the concerns that came up in the February 1st meeting. So I'd like to go over what is being uh, proposed tonight by way of petition and what the uh, Planning Commission's recommendation was and how we've gone uh, from that very first time back in 2019 to where we are today. So some of this is familiar. I'll just try to go quickly through some of these items and then talk about some of the questions that came up at the uh, council meeting last time to give a little further information on that. So the property is located at the corner of uh, Porter and 25th Street. It includes a vacant piece of land and then two existing offices. One uh, a historic home that is used as an office and also another office that was designed later on as not a historic home but uh, is included in this MU request. Also what has been taking place is the bus rapid transit stop is, is being developed uh, at the corner of this property and between the, the Baptist Church and this property on 25th Street. And two items of, of this property are some existing right-of-ways that uh, take place. One is uh, noted as a right-of-way, and that is in the lighter hashed area. The other is a right-of-way that had existed and then some uh, detransfers took place but have not extinguished that right-of-way access. And that's important to remember because that is what runs uh, east and west and it'll be part of the discussion. Again, kind of taking a look at the property right now. Uh, at one point, it had been part of Weber State, Weber College's campus. Back then, it was a junior college. And then, it later, became a parking lot. Uh, for the last 30 years, it has been, if you will, an abandoned parking lot. The asphalt's still there, but is not dedicated to any one use as it is a private ownership property. Uh, Porter Avenue and the multifamily homes are to the west of this site. And then, of course, the historic Jefferson District is to the east of this, uh, of this site. And again, as I mentioned, an alley runs both north and south, as this photo depicts, along the property lines of the Jefferson Historic District properties, and then bends and goes uh, west to, to Porter Avenue. That photo is looking south, right? That's looking south, okay. yes. All right. And those poles. Delineate where the uh, where the alley is. Okay. Um, let's see. I think I went back the wrong way, didn't I? I am going the wrong way now. Back here. Sorry. No, you threw me off. <laughs> so on Twenty Fifth Street, you've got a, a vacant piece of property, but also you have a parking lot and some trees that would be part of the the rezoning request, and so that's what we developing as part of this. Uh, quickly, I don't know if I need to really go through the history. You've, you've heard of it before. 2019, there were several meetings to discuss this. Recommendation was made, but the uh, developer at that point asked to be held until they tried to work out some things with the uh, right-of-way easement. That didn't take place. Uh, property has changed hand, uh, but the present uh, owner of the property wants to move forward with the petition. This is the project the Planning Commission looked at. It was a, a mixture of an apartment complex with some retail on the main floor on 25th Street, some townhomes that are two and a half stories and three and a half stories around a central plaza. Over time, each of those meetings the Planning Commission had, the density of the project decreased from uh, 63 units down to 38, which is what the Planning Commission looked at on August 7th in 2019. Again, changes have taken place, and now the proposal is for 21 total units, which is, again, a decrease of what the Planning Commission even looked at, and the removal of the commercial space and apartment building from the project. So this will be strictly a, a townhome live-work uh, development. 
This is the, the revised site plan that uh, they worked on showing how those homes would be aligned, both facing 25th Street and, and, and Porter Avenue and having uh, two-car garages in the, in the development for each unit and then some additional guest parking and then a, a little central court that is visible uh, from 25th Street into the project and provides access uh, from 25th Street pedestrian access into the project, as well as from Porter and vehicle access from 25th, as well as from Porter Avenue. Why considering the zone change? Well, first of all, it is petitioned, and so we do need to make a recommendation and action on it. Second of all, the request was consistent with the community plan, where it had talked about mixed use being a possible land use in this area. So the request to consider rezoning was consistent with the community plan that had been developed several years ago. Also, the BRT in its, in its development had talked about uh, looking at opportunity sites of vacant property and consider zoning changes uh, as part of the, the bus rapid transit and some provisions that are taking place in state law about making sure the the uh, mixed use or opportunities for higher density take place at, at bus transit stops. The difference between what the existing zoning is, which is R3C and the MU, uh, is the MU, uh, while it allow a few more units, uh, keeps the height a little bit lower than what the R3C would have. It also limits the uses from what the R3EC would have of some of the things like rehab treatment facilities, transitional housing, vacation rentals, boarding houses, and, and directs more to the land uses to some specific things such as townhome live work and uh, art, retail, uh, studios, those type of uses. So that's one thing the MU can do is, is limit types of uses rather than have the broad spectrum of the R3C. The other change is parking. Uh, the, instead of 1.3 stalls per unit, the developer is now proposing 2.1 stalls per unit, so an increase of parking that would take place on the site uh, from what the uh, Planning Commission had looked at last time. So here's, uh, again, some of the pictorials. This is looking for Porter Avenue of the two-story, which would be the live work, and then goes to the three stories back behind. One of the things noted is the height has now decreased from 40 feet to 38 feet, and I'll explain how that happens in a, in a moment. Again, the inner courtyard, uh, the 25th Street frontage, again, decreasing in height. And how that takes place is, this is the drawing that you looked at in February of the units. So you notice in that design, the uh, higher ridge line uh, on those buildings. What they did, taking some of the comments made by the citizens at that time, is to change the roof line from a, a, a gable end to a hip roof, which looks like that. So you can see the change that took place. And then it also brought down the height because now the ridge line could drop down also. So the, this, that, is two, that is one thing they've done. Another thing they've done is on the uh, units that face the Jefferson District, They've put in, uh, in the garage doors more of a carriage house door style. If you look at that, that door style, I'll just go back to the other one, from that garage door style to that garage door style to try to, again, get some of that flavor of the district with a carriage house, which is what some of the detached garages in the, in the district had traditionally. And again, how that changes in the ridge line. So one of the things that the uh, MU zone allows to consider is the appropriateness of design. And one of the things that we've tried to work with through the Planning Commission and the, the, uh, the MU uh, development and ordinance is to respect the, the scale of the Jefferson District and Porter Avenue. Porter Avenue being mainly two-story buildings to have the buildings being two-story on Porter. Jefferson, while they're two and a half stories, the actual height of the roof are, is, is near or above 40 feet. And so that's where, the, in this case, the height limit is, is put in place to keep that scale of the Jefferson District. The quality of the materials, the brick and, and the siding, and have some of the architectural features and, and higher pitched roofs, 
uh, and having some of the, the variations take place to allow the architecture to reflect in a modern way the architecture of, of the overall district. And again, looking at the densities, uh, that was some of the neighborhood concern. Again, they've lowered the densities from what was looked at by the Planning Commission originally. Uh, they are in keeping generally with the area, uh, 22 units an acre to on Porter, 21 units an acre, 25th Street's 43 units an acre, and then of course in, in Jefferson where it's mainly single family homes, it's a lower density at five units an acre. Again, height was a concern. This kind of gives you an idea of the heights of the buildings in the area, trying to make that transition from Porter Avenue at the lower height to uh, the taller height as, as you get towards Jefferson and with the, the church and some of the, uh, the one apartment building that's there and some of the other homes which are, because there's the steep roof, have, to have a higher ultimate height. Another neighborhood concern was traffic circulation and that deals with Porter Avenue. Um, those little orange dots show where accesses exist along Porter Avenue. And while Porter Avenue is not a through street, uh, so it, it takes all the traffic of those homes or apartments that are along the west side of Porter, even those buildings that are on Adams, their parking is off of uh, Porter Avenue. And then it uh, puts it onto, onto that street. This project would add another 147 cars per day uh, but it gives them two ways in and out where Porter, the others on Porter Avenue only have one way and that is Porter. These give access uh, from 225th Street also. Another concern was that Porter Avenue itself with the way people park on the street and its width uh, creates some concerns of congestion. As people park along the street, uh, there's 24 feet of pavement. And it was mentioned at the last meeting, the concern that fire apparatus would not be able to get in and out with this additional uh, traffic being added. Of course, that situation exists now, exists now without any development taking place on this property. That with the general fire standards, uh, because there really has not been a concern, we have not enforced anything of no parking on the street. Uh, but if, if things did become difficult, that'd be the first thing that we'd look at because the street width in itself is, is wide enough to handle fire equipment, but fire equipment and parking, uh, it may create a difficult time. Uh, we've had some other streets where we've had to go in and to put up no parking signs because of the tr parking that takes place. But with or without development, that situation exists now. Uh, the, the ability to maybe have the road meet the fire department exists now without any new development. And talking with the, the uh, fire marshal, uh, he said if we needed to, they would may, may look at that, but right now they don't feel the need to do that. But again, that's something that if this development doesn't happen, that still is an issue that exists with Porter Avenue. Uh, as you can see with what is taking place now without the development there, the other thing we looked at is what is the future development that could affect that. There are two vacant parcels, one on the west side of Porter and one on the east side of Porter, which is this request. Again, the development of the uh, west side would dump onto Porter and again with its existing conditions and no rezoning request needs to be considered. If the east part isn't rezoned, uh, future development will still dump onto Porter Avenue. And uh, again, the issues would be there that if it gets too uh, congested, then we'd have to look at putting no parking on Porter Avenue to allow it to circulate and meet the needs. The street in and of itself with the width, as I said, can meet the, the, the traffic that comes in and out of it in terms of its capacity. The question would be parking on the sides of the street. And at some point, if it does become a problem, that is what the solution is. There is no really other solution other than, it, you know, eminent domain buying the homes and making the road wider. But at that point, you've lost some of the density of why you'd be doing that to begin with. So that is just kind of a little further discussion of what the concern was that came up last time. And if you have any questions, I'm going along. Just stop me, and and I'll be fine to answer anything.
Again, as I mentioned, another concern was parking that had been addressed. Um, and this development uh, really does look to increase the, the number of parking stalls that are taking place on site to relieve any potential pressure that could take place on Porter by not having sufficient stalls for the, for the development. Another concern was the nine rails plan where it had some language which uh, said one thing and another set of language said another thing. One about creating a higher densities and mixed use while the other thing talked about looking at uh, uh, more of a, what I call the shotgun home artist uh, colony that could take place there, single story, small uh, bungalows that could take place in that area. And then looking at that, that's the question of balancing the, the vision and the evolution that's taken place over time as, as the nine rails first proposed things and as development trends are, are moving uh, in today's market and what is affordable, what they can build, um, and where is the demand. Another concern was in the Jefferson uh, Historic District Protection. So this red line shows you the Jefferson District Historic Boundaries, and then the yellow shows you where this proposed project is. As you can see, it, it does about against the portion of the Jefferson Historic District. Um, it is in, in a way the only infill project that is occurring along the Jefferson Historic District boundaries. Um, other properties uh, have developed in the past in the district itself and uh, this one is the first one outside of the district but adjacent to the district in, in terms of potential development. So one of the things that's important to understand about the historic districts is the Jefferson District is both a national and a local historic district. And I'll just give you a little difference of what the two are. A national district is, is of course, an important recognition. And it's there to give incentives in terms of uh, tax funding or tax rebates as work is done on historic properties. But a national district, unless federal funds are being used, doesn't protect any of the homes from, from uh, being amended, revised, cut up, demolished. Whereas the local district being pay, put on the local register controls the design, uh, controls uh, revisions that take place on the building, uh, can limit demolition. And so the local district is the district that has the ability to make sure that the, the things are protected when every day to day items take place. And some uh, council members have had to go through that process as they look to do things on their home. Whereas the national district doesn't have any of those criteria or evaluations to take place. The key part is that those districts on the local only have those standards of those things that are within those district boundaries. One of the things we tried to do when we did the East Central Community Plan is to add some design standards in the, in the East C zones, whether it be R3, R2, in those areas that are in a national district only, the Central Bench District, but are not in a local district. And that way in zoning, we try to create some criteria to try to at least look at compatibility issues with developments. In this case, we're trying to do the same thing with the development agreement if it changes to a mixed use zone. Still set some of those same design criteria into the development agreement as if the zone changes to MU. And that is to still try to look at the compatibility issues uh, being next to the Jefferson District. However, again, those general preservation standards only apply to things that are on the local register. And so that's where I think there's some tension that occurs of protecting the Jefferson District by going beyond the Jefferson District with some of the local uh, landmarks requirements where they really can't be in, uh, put in, in, in effect by having each building looked at by landmark. But they can be in effect by, in this case, a development agreement where you're looking at those compatibility issues, or the R3 EC where it had already incorporated some of those ideas into it. 
but that is something I think that's important to make a distinction of how do we help preserve the district when you're not in the exact district. And what are, what are the things that we've done zoning wise to try to address that and still trying to address that if the zone changes to, to mixed use. This again is another thing of those design compatibility. If you look at this, this map was done when we created the Central Bench National District. And it was a survey of buildings uh, outside the, the two uh, local districts, Jefferson and Eccles, that identify buildings that are either compatible uh, with uh, the historic preservation are out of period or are ineligible because of modifications made to it. And so you can kind of see around the Jefferson area, uh, those buildings and, and what their ratings are. Uh, of course, you look along Porter, there's not a lot of the buildings. There's, there's three that are eligible, four, four that are eligible buildings if they were to stand alone. And, uh, but you've got a, a flavor of a variety of designs that took place around the Jefferson District on, on all four sides. So again, that's why we created the zoning standards to try to address that and don't use uh, Secretary of the Interior standards because they don't apply uh, if it's not on the local register or if they're not seeking federal tax credits. The other concern is that uh, alleyway. And again, one of the things the Planning Commission recommended is that the people who have rights to that alley along Jefferson uh, would need to make an agreement to approve the shift of that uh, right of way that runs uh, east and west to still give them access. And they come to that mutual agreement in that location. Uh, the other thing is that with the development, those, uh, right, those right of ways would be paved and upgraded from how they are presently, They're kind of beaten up and, and worn out. Um, so I understand from the developer, they've identified I think four uh, properties that have access to that uh, east-west portion of the right-of-way. And they're still trying to work with those uh, homeowners to come to an agreement of a relocation. That still has not been completed, so just to make you aware of that, but they're still trying to work on that. So, as I mentioned earlier and last time we presented, there's two parts. One is considering rezoning, and in that is the development agreement to set the limits on number of units, the height, the live work, relief, some of the architectural items that would need to take place. One of the concerns also to address lighting, that it doesn't go into the neighbor's uh, property, especially on the backs of Jefferson. And then the Planning Commission recommended 6 to approve the rezoning and 5 to 1 to the development agreement. The second part of this is then with uh, MU zone is a change of the ordinances. And so this is to, to change the text to set some standards that specifically apply to, to this portion of the MU. And that's limiting land uses, uh, as I mentioned, to restaurants, retail, offices, apartments, townhomes art studios, galleries, uh, setting standards uh, in terms of setbacks, building heights, and these are all corrected now from the discussion we had at the 1st of February, these new numbers. The parking uh, variations, open space screening, and again, control of exterior lights. And so building materials, what their criteria are, the types of, of roof style, uh, having bays, brick, hardy board, those materials that fit the character of the area. And the Planning Commission recommended five to one to approve these text amendments. The one dissenting vote on this was feeling that, that it, was, it still could go further. And this was back in 2019 uh, when that vote was taken. So those are the items you have for consideration tonight. Thank you, Greg. Any questions from the council? I have a few questions, um, but I was wondering, is the petitioner going to um, speak to you? If you want them to, yes. Yeah, I just have a quick question for the petitioner. Welcome. Marty McFadden, 689 
Canyon Meadows Drive, South Weaver, Utah. Oh, don't be nervous. It's okay. Um, well, thanks, Marty. I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate all the work that you've put into creating this development plan. I guess one question just keeps popping up in my mind, um, something that we've talked a lot with the residents that are concerned about the development, is why not just build something under the R3? You've gone through this process and petition to do the MU, but you could build something under the current zoning. So. That's a great question. I, I think that, you know, from, from our side with, with my team, we want to put something there that, um, that is, is somewhat reflective and pays homage to the existing historical character of the area. Um, and, and, you know, that, the, the design that you've seen is, is a reflection of that. Um, yeah, we, 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 we could do apartments. We could do two giant four-story apartments right now and preserve the right-of-way that currently exists and call it a day. And we're totally entitled to do that. But we, we feel like this is a better product for Ogden. We think this is a, a better fit for the neighborhood. And I, I think that this is going to bring, you know, a, a, a citizens to, to the community um, in downtown that is going to continue to help with the revitalization of downtown Ogden. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome to, if you have anything else you want to share with the council, you can. We generally afford that opportunity to petitioners, so. I think uh, Councilman Traburka really teed it up well. I, that's, that's really what's in my heart. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Chair, I'd, I'd like a crack at Greg for just a second, just, just to clear in my mind um, the, the development agreement portion of this, as it opposed as it uh, relates to the MU zone, uh -huh. is it an MUCO? Is that what it's going to end up being, or is it a? Well, with the MU, it, it, it's similar to that, but in the MU zone, we don't call it the CO. Okay. It just runs with each MU. They, property. they all develop under their own conditional their, their development agreement. Yeah. Okay. That, I just wanted to be clear that I that I understood that. Yeah. So okay. Um, Thank you, uh, Chair. I, I think we're going to accept public input on this. I mm -hmm. um, I tried to get a hold of Travis uh, weeks ago, but I got a bad number for you, so I didn't get you. Um, <laughs> um, but but the question I wanted to ask was, if not this, then what? You know, what would what would the neighbors like, or what would you know? I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's not practical to expect it to end. To be empty ground forever, and sure. so, and they do have uh, a right to build on its current zone, which I think many would probably say wouldn't be as good for the neighborhood as what they're proposing. And so, that's if if the neighbor if the concerned people would kind of help me over that hump, I would really appreciate it. That's a fair question. Yeah. Well, seeing that Travis and others arrived just in time for the item, we'll open it up to public input. If you care to address the council on this item, please limit your comments to three minutes and state your name for the record. And send me your contact later. You, what's that? Yeah. Send you, me your contact later. You, let, you didn't leave a message. It was the right number. You just didn't Oh, it was the right number? Correct. Oh, it so, sounded like it was. I got somebody yeah, completely said, wrong. said, hey, sorry, I'm not here to leave a message. And then I just checked and I was like, oh, that's oh, okay. number. Well, but that I was my, call you back I guess I got a good you number. You didn't call a message. You didn't sorry leave a message. So I was like, I'll call him back if he needs to call me versus just a, box, okay. a pocket dial. So. All right. Um, primarily, yeah, Travis Pate, 2546 Jefferson. Uh, as I look at this, the, the process, we feel like we've been beat up, battered, and bruised through the whole process, not just to the most recent, the council has extended every courtesy, uh, but the process of providing input and then just kind of being passively, either passively aggressive beat down or <laughs> just actually outright beat down. Uh, I submitted, and with Cindy Toon and I submitted an application to the Board of Zoning Adjustment. We paid our fee. Uh, we've yet to hear from it. And that was September 5th of 2019. Uh, and, and I actually uh, had the opportunity to visit with Mr. Montgomery and Mr. Stratford at the time and said and expressed my concern as I submitted this because Mr. Montgomery is the same person that is presenting, but is also the same person that represents the Board of Zoning Adjustments. And so I said, I feel it's a co conflict of interest. And so I asked Mr. Stratford at the time 
if it would be possible to possibly have neighborhood development, just walk through the steps and just make sure T's are crossed and I's are dotted. I've yet to hear from it uh, other than uh, Mr. Montgomery attempted to call me and said, uh, I have your application. I paper clipped your money to the front of it. Come and pick it up. Even though I've paid for it through the, through the quarter's office and it was submitted all legal and above board. Where is it? Where has it been since September 5th of, of 2019? Where, and why is my money still paper clipped if possibly on his desk? Instead of the attorney's office coming back to me saying, hey, it's not quite, quite yet the right forum. It's still the right forum, but you may be a little bit premature on it. Here's a refund of check. Please file it such and such a day. Nothing has happened. Quite tragic. Quite tragic. Uh, the other aspect is, if not this, then what? I've submitted it to you uh, by way of the, uh, the onboard Ogden. Ogden on board says, the neighborhood plan for the central business district supports higher density transit supportive development, but the remainder of the neighborhoods are planned to remain single family areas, right? in the document. So as you read the whereas and what for saying, this meets the on board and the opportunity sites. The opportunity site would be a heritage garden. The opportunity site would be recognizing that four mayors were right there on that block. Kiesel, Kirkendall, Mayor Fell, and uh, Mayor Hiram H. Spencer. His house on Jefferson has been fully restored and yet the historic properties interview, historic properties inventory still says it's a non-contributing use. Hmm, well, update the, please update that. Spend the same money that you've spent on demolition, $500,000 for one little corner, 60 by 100 on Adams and 26th Street. We could have had a historic properties in inventory for that, like, that much money. Um, so I'm saying that there's a lot more that can be done. And I, I had nothing against the current petitioner. It's been the process over and over. And so the dynamic for us is, is here's the petition again, so you guys can have it, the application. Um, and uh, I don't know what to do other than, like I said, we've just been beaten. Brandon, can you grab that for us? Thanks, bud. Okay, anyone else? Thanks, bud. Anybody else? Deborah Darrington, 20. Oh, there. <laughs> there you go. Now you can hear me. Deborah Darrington, 2555 Jefferson Avenue. Um, I do appreciate being notified of this. I think that for the most part, my concern with any project going around is not that not only that my voice is heard, but that I am able to listen to what is being presented in my neighborhood and what's going on. I haven't had an opportunity at the last meeting to purvey that and to see what was going on. And I don't think we're ever going to have an ideal situation where what is ideal for me is going to be ideal for the neighbor next to me. But I learned a long time ago um, when I moved to Ogden that when you draw a circle around a community, I thought that enclosed us and all of us were part of a community in that. But what I've since discovered is when we draw that circle, it doesn't draw a circle around us. It draws a circle that doesn't let other people in. That seems a controversy to what my point would be today because I'm already in that circle. But what I would like to see in the community of Ogden is what drew, not only drew me here, but caused me to stay. I'm in a home that is way too big for three people. It's expensive to maintain and it would be ideal to turn it back to 16 apartments. But I won't do that because there was a lot that was invested before me and a lot that I need to pay tribute to those people that built this historic community and makes it such a pleasure for me to live. I still walk down the streets of Ogden and stop at house after house and admire. And you'll hear me say, oh my gosh, isn't that brick so beautiful? Why don't we see that anymore? We need to maintain that. There's an importance to that. That doesn't mean that the townhouses behind me aren't a good fit. I would prefer single housing, um, single family dwelling. I know that our community, our street is next to none. I know that people walk down that street and wish they lived there and I'm proud and honored to be able to live there. I would love to see others have that opportunity in single family dwellings 
where they are in the shadow of my home and I'm in the shadow of theirs. I have 102 windows in my home. The only reason I know that is it was a school project. My daughter proudly went and told everyone we had 102 windows. The reason I purchased that home is because out every single one of those 102 windows is an incredible view. One of those views is of the historic art center. One is over at Chaburka's. I can see their home and all of those beautiful homes across the street. But one not so pretty view to some would be the house, the view out my north window. It is about, well, not even a half stone throw from the Manfield side brick. But that is the picture. That window is the one that I photograph out my laundry room window more than not because it is historic, it's beautiful. It's taller than my home, I believe. So it's not about height. It's not about keeping people out of the community. It's about bringing them in with what suits and keeps those of us who are already here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, my name is Dennis Mansfield, and I live at 2547 Jefferson. Um, i got to apologize to all you council people because uh, for the past two years, me and my wife has been out of the country, and we haven't had an opportunity to hear all the arguments for or against this uh, situation of building uh, various buildings behind uh, the Jefferson Historic District. But I want to convey to you that uh, uh, 12 years ago, we come in an agreement with Ogden City. We purchased that home that was abandoned, almost destroyed from Ogden City, made an agreement with Ogden City. We purchased that uh, property and my wife convinced me to put uh, a half a million dollars in, into restoring the property as a, as a historic home. And um, hopefully we did that. I think Ogden City is pleased with what it turned out to be, doesn't Mr. Montgomery? Uh, the problem I have <clears throat> is talking in front of a lot of people. <laughs> but I am very uncomfortable. But what I want to convey is the question is, was raised that uh, what are we going to do with this property that is vacant? What should we do with it? I think the c concerns of the people in the Jefferson Historic District is to have something that doesn't approach onto their, their homes, that it, it keeps it historical. You know, it, it's like living somewhere than somebody building an airport right over the top of your house. Uh, it might be a wonderful thing to have the art centers and the various things like that. Um, but the situation is, is where it's located and the, the feasibility of maintaining and taking care of the area that is proposed to put. I have a folder that was given to me, um, and it's called the Porter Towns, but it looks like they're, tr they're wanting to put 21 units in there. Uh, my understanding is Porter is not a legal street. I've driven down it many times because that's where I go behind my home around Porter to clean the weeds out to keep from getting a ticket uh, in my backyard uh, for uh, uh, cleanup and weed protection. And it's a very, very narrow area to get in and get out. But with the right of way that I have, that I understand by record, I own a right of way through there and two other uh, people own the right of way through there. Thank you, Mr. Mansfield. We got to wrap it up. Okay. Thanks for so anyway, time. that's my concern is to look at 
at what people invest in the historic district thank you before you you know make a decision on what we're going to go behind us thank you okay. thank you okay anyone else sorry travis we already had you no nope, that's not correct katie nelson could not be here so she asked that i represent from the weaver county heritage foundation they want to just resubmit are you on the county i'm oh. on the weaver county heritage foundation board okay. of directors yes thank you so I, I i would like so katie asked me if she would not if she couldn't make it that the same application that went forth to the planning commission be re-emphasized there's a letter uh from the weaver county heritage foundation that also says that they don't agree with the current reason the rezoning and that also down zoning is the is the appropriate aspect as and that's from the state historic preservation office and so from the state historic preservation office it said the only way to preserve historic neighborhoods is by down zoning from the densities because once the densities come in and creep in then uh, we end up like other places like no like basically uh, sorry <laughs> like in Canada and other places where people are coming in, tearing down and building McMansions and other things on the, on the, in the historic districts. And so they, they said that the down zoning is pretty much the same thing. So, so that's from the Weaver County Heritage Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Anybody online, Brandon? Okay. Seeing no more movement questions or comments from the council. Just, can we have a clarification about the zoning application? I don't think I know any. I don't know anything about that. Good question. I'm not sure either. But Greg, can you get, can you enlighten us on the board of zoning adjustments? I don't think I feel like I've role. heard about that before. It's That's not right. I missed it. So after the planning commission made their recommendation, Mr. Pate uh, went to the recorder's office to file uh, a request that the planning commission made an administrative error and have the Board of Adjustments uh, overturn the Planning Commission's actions. Uh, both myself and, and Tracy, had, the city recorder, had explained that this is a legislative action and is not something that the Board of Adjustments can review and that the petition to go to the Board of Adjustments really shouldn't be filed. And we offered to return, just send it back, no, not even accept it. Uh, he demanded that it be received. We said, but we can't do it. This is a legislative action until the city council acts on it. There's nothing to appeal. And if it city council then acts it, your appeal is not the Board of Adjustments because it's a legislative action. You'd go to court and take the city to court. Uh, but he said, no, you keep my money. I want my petition heard. And we said, well, it'd be better if you just took it back. And he <laughs> would not take it back, so Tracy still has, has the money and has the application still, uh, so that once you make an action, we return it back because then, again, it's a legislative action, not an administrative action, and the Board of Adjustments has no ability to hear a legislative action and deem that it's a, a, a error has been made in decision. Uh, that's not what the Board of Adjustment does. So, yeah, the petition is still there. The money is still there. He would not accept it back because we explained again, it's not anything they can hear. Just take it back now. And he demanded that it be retained and kept until action is taken uh, finally on this project. Okay. Thanks, Greg. I have another quick question. Uh, so just to make sure that I am understanding correctly, the <coughs> petitioner mentioned that under the current zoning, he could build apartments there. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, the difference in the one slide I showed is 18 units versus, in their proposal, 21. So under the present zoning, they could build 18 units. Uh, under the proposal, is 21, but it could be done as an apartment rather than townhomes. Okay, what was the, what a, so 18, that plot would handle only 18 apartments? Correct. Correct. All right, thank you. Did, did that answer your question Nine. on the Board of Adjusting? Board of Adjustments? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think understanding <laughs> yeah. that it doesn't work. So they could sue or, or yeah, bring something against the city later, right? right? They'd have to go through court with right. that. That they, you were arbitrary and capricious in your action. Mm -hmm. legislative, again, this is a legislative action, not an administrative action. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. So we have a copy of the application. There's no application to us 
might as well be an application to file for a driver's license. We, we don't have authority to do anything with that either. Correct. Um, but we'll, I guess we'll take that into consideration during our legislative decision. Just this history. Yeah, just as okay. a FYI of what, where it is. Thank you. So it's basically, in my understanding, it's an appeal of the zoning board. It would be an appeal to a decision made by the Planning Commission is what it is, but. But theirs is only a recommendation and not a final action. Correct. And right. so no final action has been taken. And again, okay. it's not an administrative action, it's a legislative action. Okay, thank you. There's, okay. so there's no check in, there's no check included either so we don't have to return any payments it's as clear as it's gonna get <laughs> i guess so <laughs> thank you okay any other questions from council i answer that there's a minute turnaround on that because i, I was sorry no, I'm saying things it's not it's not the time members. or the place travis council members. not the time or the place it is you guys all voted that one more minute can come back for a rebuttal or if, if clarification from the, from the audience yes. That's i think at my long. discretion thank you we've We've heard, if we have more questions for you, we'll bring you up. Enough, thank you. Okay. Any more questions from the council? Okay. We'll entertain action on the item. I can't make a motion, so. <laughs> <laughs> Chair, I, I, uh, I, I've just been pausing for a minute just to kind of work through in my mind a little bit. Um, I, I am sympathetic to the neighbors that uh, this is going to change their world to some extent. And I have, you know, in... in in our code, in certain places where there's a different zone, you know, zone uh, uh, coming together, you know, like a residential to a commercial, they, we have we have policies that there be a, a some kind of a buffer, you know, and we try to to make sure that those happen. Um, I asked this, uh, uh, I think, four weeks ago when we first, you know, when we were hearing it then, if there's any anything in our code or a best practice that could be looked at that would help us to, to kind of determine what a, how, how that buffer might look. Um, and, and as far as I can tell, there, there isn't anything at, at this point at least. And I, I guess I'm hopeful that, although we do have two of these um, historic districts in town, that, Eccles and Jefferson, right? Um, that we learn something from this and hopefully with Landmark's help or somebody like that could maybe help us to find out what what best practice we might employ to make sure that that there is a buffer, you know, from these historical, uh, these national historic districts. I am very uh, happy with our, with the proposal uh, the developer who has proposed this, they seem to have been as eager to make change to to uh, to help uh, alleviate the concerns as best as any any developer I've ever seen, and and that's 16 years on the planning commission and 10 here, so that's a long time. Um, and I and I look at it and I and I really wouldn't mind living next to it. You know, I don't really see a, a huge problem um, other than uh, that it isn't historic. We're, we're not building hundred year old houses anymore. We're, you know, they, You're lucky if you, you know, <laughs> so I, I don't know how we can do that in this area. You know, we, they're, they're going to be new. Whatever's built is going to be a new thing. Um, you can try and emulate uh, architecture and, and style and some of those kind of things, and I think that that's what they've attempted to do. Um, and so that that's kind of where I find myself. Um, I, boy, I can't find a reason to deny it. I can't. So. So since since you're helping us with your reasoning, and I really appreciate it, yeah. I, I I just make sure that I ask a quick question 
to make sure if I, if I missed it, I'm sorry. But so the mixed use live work. So this is going to allow businesses to be operated out of these units. Is that correct? Greg could probably answer better, but I, but I'll tell you what he told me. Yeah. You know, live works are different than at home, uh, occupations. Mm -hmm. There is a space that provides a, a commercial feel mm -hmm. that is open to uh, retail or, or, you know, people that want that service or, or product. And therefore it doesn't really qualify for at home occupation, but it is a, it is a, a genuine uh, category live work. And I'm assuming those are all going to be on the bottom floor. Uh, so people aren't going to have to go up, up to get to these, but uh, that the residents, the, the, just the live, just the live units would be you know, above the ground floor. That, did I do okay, Greg? <laughs> sure. sure. Yeah, please, please. So what it would add is the idea of uh, those homes along Porter Avenue, they, they'll have an extended plaza in their front area and allow that space to be an art studio if they want to display art for the art stroll, that it could come around that corner and have those type of things. It would allow uh, teaching in terms of dance studios or that in those spaces, in the live work spaces. And so there, there would be, if you will, a, a limited type of commercial activity where they, an artist could make a product and then sell it in the front of, of the, uh, the uh, development along Porter Avenue. Not, not limited to the r stroll day, right? Just Not any, limited any to the r stroll, yeah, but, yeah. but that's the type of activity sure, that could sure. take place there. Okay. But that is the, the, if you will, the arts part of being in the Nine Rails District that was added as a land use that could take place. But any business that is allowable under the zoning for uh, business in that area could be allowed. It would only be those uh, artistic type businesses and then the the two buildings that are included, which are offices now, they're included in the MU, that those offices would be still allowed to continue. So is, the architect's is that, office and the uh, the multi office in the... Is that the classification? Like what's the exact classification of the businesses? Well, what it says is um, Retail of the following types. Uh, special retail provided that 50% of the products sold are located, uh, are locally produced, and the floor area of the retail space does not exceed 2,000 square feet. Live work dwelling unit provided in compliance with the section four of live work. Uh, design, manufacture, and assembly of art pieces provided no outdoor storage of materials or assembly occurs. Art gallery. So those are the okay. limits of what would be allowed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Any other questions? Questions, comments, clarifications? I'll just make a quick comment just to Luis's question, um, too, is that um, they're not live workspaces, but when we started doing kind of a study of the types of people that were living in the arts district, or especially on my block, there's a ton of people working from home. I mean, I'm one of them now. I wasn't at the time. But there's a lot of people that actually have their own businesses that work out of their home that are not the kind that we're talking about. But anyway, I just think it's uh, unique to that part of town. It was an interesting thing that we found that there was so many people that had home offices that were working from home in that area. So I think that sort of um, tells you a little bit more about that type of lifestyle down there, that people do that kind of thing. And this just gives people more opportunity to actually sell things out of their home too you know just gives a little bit of a different angle on that as well so are, are you uh, so, so when you're talking about that you're talking about people that have at home occupations or people that just work from home there, there is a difference really right well yeah because you're you have your whole you know business <laughs> there but many people do both I would say they like me they might just work from home for a different company but a lot of yeah. people actually are business owners that live in their home that actually do their business out of their home, but they don't have clients come there or something. That, that's like, that's yeah. that's what I think is you know yeah. an, an at home occupation. People don't come to the house, right? Uh, except for hairdressers, uh, people like that. But but generally, people mm -hmm. that just work from home, they zoom or whatever, and it, yeah. you know it's, they're not in the really... olden days. Though I'm talking about before that time, <laughs> too. yeah. Yeah. Really the olden. Days. <laughs>
two years, years ago. ago. Two yeah. years ago are the olden <laughs> yeah. days. Yeah. Anyway, and I guess I do feel the same. I mean, I understand that this feels like a really big um, disrupt disruption to the neighborhood. I just, I, I keep going back and forth between this feeling of like, a developer could build something that would not be fitting at all in the neighborhood there right now, and we couldn't do anything about it, right? And we've had this developer, and even the one prior, that was willing to have conversations with us about how we could make it better, and they even adjusted based on the comments that we gave last week. And I also just want to give the caveat that they will have to work out a legal agreement with everybody that has rights to that right away. So even if we pass this, that process will still have to happen. So that makes me feel better that they still are going to have to work out something with those neighbors too. So, and I just don't want to see the archangel out there the whole summer. Like, that's what our life is otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's an empty lot where all kinds of things go on and it's not safe. Dr. Jevico? Nope. Okay. Anybody else? Any more findings of fact for you, or is that no, what that, is that, what guess, that was? I, that that kind of was my findings of fact. We don't have to do those, but I yeah. but I thought it would be well if, if I kind of gave the foundation underneath the motion that I'm about to make that uh, I move that we approve ordinance 2022-7. And I'll second. Okay. And that your rationale was very helpful for me, so thank you. Thank you. We have a motion by. Council Member Heyer, second by Council Member Chaburka to adopt uh, proposed ordinance 2022-7. This is a roll call vote. Council Member Chaburka? Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Council Member Ritchie? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Blair? Aye. Vice Chair Lopez? Aye. Chair Nadolsky? Aye. That passes. Chair, I would also make a motion that we adopt Ordinance 2022-8. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Heyer, second by Council Member Blair to adopt proposed Ordinance 2022-8. This also is a roll call vote. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Council Member Ritchie? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Blair? Aye. Council Member Chaburka? Aye. Vice Chair Lopez? Aye. Chair Nadolsky? Aye, right, that also passes. I didn't expect it to go quite like that, but it did. And um, maybe we all have similar rationale to what Council Member Heyer shared, but if anybody cares to share any comments, or you're welcome to. Chair, I just have one quick comment, and I, I just, I really appreciate it. I think one of the hardest things to do right now is to try to figure out um, housing accessibility. And I really appreciate that there's, 21 units going in that will be for sale for people that will be able to um, hopefully access a, a different type of um, house, housing stock. And so I really appreciate you uh, uh, doing that and not just throwing up some apartments and not thinking about Ogden. And I know that it's not perfect for everyone, but it, at least it's part of that whole picture and, and, and start to putting that puzzle of pieces together of, of housing accessibility so I appreciate that um, and I know that it's it's difficult to, to figure out how to thread that needle but thank you thanks for sharing chair I, I also want to acknowledge the people that that purchase inside of a, a historic district that is you know they are people that that really care for the for the history and for the for the homes and you know I I I salute them, and I, you know, we have one on our council that has has done that. I, I had a brother-in-law that bought one of those homes on that street, and it wasn't for him. He sold and got out. He, it's never ending, that's for sure. Yeah, he just and and while I was kind of you know we were close to them, we could see. Oh yeah, you know you gotta you gotta be dedicated to to do that, and so I salute the people that that are there, and I and I'm thankful that they're concerned about their neighborhood. Um, and I hope we can somehow inject, uh, at least appeal to the, to the Landmarks Commission to, to maybe have that discussion. What can we do that would be a, a best practice in Ogden that, uh, for things that abut, um, a, a National Historic District? 
I yeah. think that would be helpful. And I think this developer did a great job taking that feedback. I, um, I absolutely you know, several do. Several of the neighbors about changing the garage mm -hmm. doors, the yep. roof line, et cetera. Yeah, I, that, I thought that was pretty remarkable that next thing we were presented with was that. And, and he just, he didn't get forced to do it. Nobody twisted his arm. He just did it. I, I, it was the right thing to do. Yeah, do I just, yeah. I thought, what a great, right. we'll go out and build some more stuff. <laughs> <in August>. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I just want to say that, you know, I we're in a a challenging spot. I guess there's a lot of forces coming together on these, especially in these vacant lots. Um, I, I I just since the start of hearing this issue, I I kind of cringed at what the alternative was with the mm -hmm. existing zoning, and I think for us it's important that we evaluate and and come up with the, the highest and best use of the land, um, especially in light of the current condition, the current forces that are in the market. And I, the alternative wasn't, in my view. I think this is much, much better. I think that every iteration was better. And I think that the council, I commend you all for giving the, the proposal more opportunities for improvement. Um, that maybe is putting a shine on it, but especially if you're the, the developer, um, that's, you know, more iterations and more time is, is more money, but I do believe that it came to a better place than it was. So thank you for that. I don't want to send a signal for others in the community that are looking at investing in Ogden to think, well, if I go there, I'm going to get the runaround and whatever the neighbors say goes. Um, we need to make sure that everybody, neighbors and property owners and property developers have a fair, fair voice. So I, I feel like we landed in that place. There's plenty of room one way or another in terms of what that fairness might be, I suppose. But um, for me, it met that, uh, kind of met that mark. So <laughs> I really wasn't expecting it to go that way, 7-0, but it sounds like we all kind of landed in the same place. So, <coughs> okay, thanks, thanks, Greg. Thank you, developer. Thank your neighborhood. Next item is... Uh, new business, which is a matter of kind of old business at this point. Ross Watkins, policy analyst for the council staff, will be presenting once again proposed redistricting. Okay, so you have before you two joint resolutions. Uh, one is for uh, municipal districts and the other one is for voter participation areas. I just want to uh, do the history again for you um, and for the community to see uh, where this started, why we have to do this. Um, do I have control over these slides? Okay. Okay. So this kind of started back, well, this started with the census. Um, it, every time a census occurs, we receive new, da new data population, or population data, uh, and that's used, that kind of trickles down to the state and local levels and redistricting it becomes necessary. So in September 2021, this past year, we had a strategy session. Uh, we talked about um, how this is going to move forward. I talked about what the county was going to do with their data, how they were going to draw new precincts. Um, and then that, th then the state drew their um, new boundaries in November, which cleared the way for the county to draw precincts in December. Um, and as soon as the county had drawn their precincts, we, we were given the green light to take a look at our, our um, municipal boundaries, uh, voter participation areas, and school district boundaries. So we were required to adjust all of those to match the new precincts. Um, so in December this past year, uh, the council adopted new voter participation area boundaries, um, which will need to be updated again so they can match our new district boundaries. Um, so then in January, um, I didn't put this down, but in January, new school district boundaries were drawn um, to meet the new precinct boundaries. Uh, the council office also met office also met with um, some other staff from the city to put together some map options to present to you. We tried to get creative. We tried to um, uh, use some of your input to draw new maps to just show you some different options that you could consider. Uh, we presented those to council members and in February, <clears throat> excuse me, in February we reviewed the precinct changes, looked at map options together. In March we held a fact-finding session. Uh, we had kind of a, a 
public notification blast to social media. Just tried to get all, try to get the word out there. We had a, a survey, got a little bit of input from the survey where people looked at the maps and told us what they thought. Uh, we didn't get a lot of uh, feedback from the fact finding meeting. Um, so that's kind of what brings us to where we are right now. We have, we have, um, we, we kind of took the general consensus to be that map option number one, which most closely resembles your current map, uh, was the map that you would like to move forward with. So we included that in the joint resolutions. Um, so that's what you have before you today. Um, just to clarify, you do have until May to take care of municipal redistricting. Um, we, it can be taken care of today because we have the joint resolutions before you, but if you'd like to take more time and look at more map options, that is possible. May 10th is a hard deadline set by the state. You can't go any longer than that. Um, so this is, this is kind of where we ended up, uh, ended up after looking at a few different maps. Uh, the current map on the left and then option one and option two. Option one most similarly represents the current map. This is as close as we could get. Um, without making any, th you'll notice there are some adjustments that, that we had to make to, to almost mimic our current map. And those were, those were necessitated by precinct changes. Um, the precincts, we, we had 45, they went down to 41, so the precincts got bigger. So it got, it got a little bit harder to balance out each of the districts population-wise. Option two, as you'll remember, um, is, is an east-west uh, perspective that we uh, discussed during our fact-finding session. Uh, so this is, this is what we have today, our current map, and then the map that we came up with that most similarly represents that map. And then these are the two maps that are included in the joint resolutions. They're identical. Uh, one is just entitled municipal districts, and the other one is voter participation areas because they are supposed to match one another. So that's all that I have for you today. Are there any other, are there any questions for me? Any questions for Ross? Good job. Thanks. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Thank you, Ross. Thanks. Okay. If there's no questions from the council, we can entertain uh, action on this item. Chair, I would make a motion then that uh, we um, adopt joint resolution 2022-3 concerning the, the uh, municipal districts. I second. We have a motion by council member Heyer, second by vice chair Lopez to adopt proposed joint resolution 2022-3. This is a roll call vote. Council member Ritchie. Aye. Council member White. Aye. Council member Blair. Aye. Council Member Chaburka? No. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair Lopez? Aye. Chair Nadolsky? Aye. That passes. Um, before we move to the next item, Council Member Chaburka, you can. Oh, yes. Um, thank you, Chair, for the mm -hmm. opportunity. I think I mentioned this in the work session that I, I just feel we could have done a little bit more community outreach to get more engagement. Um, I know that we did several efforts, so I'm not trying to criticize the staff for that. I just think that there's other ways that we could help to get feedback about redistricting, and I don't know if people really understand how much it might impact them. Um, so I'm just opposed to passing it at this time. Thank you. Still have one more item on participation areas. Chair, I'd make a motion that we adopt a joint resolution 2022-4 concerning voter participation areas. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Heyer, second by Councilmember Ritchie to adopt proposed joint resolution 2022-4. This is also a roll call vote. Councilmember White? Aye. Councilmember Blair? Aye. Councilmember Chaburka? No. Councilmember Heyer? Aye. Councilmember Ritchie? Aye. Vice Chair Lopez? Aye. Chair Nadolsky? Aye. That passes. Anything else to add? Okay, I figured. Okay, thank you, Ross, for your attention to detail on that for us. Um, next item on our agenda is public comments. This is an opportunity to address the council regarding concerns or ideas on any topic. We have 
Oh, go ahead. let's start with the people in, yep. in the chambers and then we'll get to the couple of hands raised online. Come on up, sorry. <laughs> Hello. How you doing? Good. Thank you. Thanks. State your name. And so my name is David Carlson. I'm a stakeholder out at the Ogden Airport. Okay. Uh, 3985 Airport Road is my address. And it's been a little bit. Uh, last time I was with you in this room was June 26 of 2018. A lot of you were here. Um, I know this because you can go on YouTube, search Ogden City, June 26 of 2018. And there's a video of that meeting here. During this meeting at the one hour and 26 minute mark, Gary Williams, our city attorney, addressed the city council. He was concerning the airport land lease fee increases. Gary looked at the city council and said, and I quote, this is a one-time adjustment, up by about 25%. After that, we'll, we'll continue on with the consumer price index. This will bring us up to date and to find a way to cut into our deficit. Well, I'm sure that sounded great. It's not too big of a jump. I was actually happy, even though your vote cost me personally 225% increase in my land fee increases. I was happy to pay. Those increases were first put in effect in the year 2019. Gary Williams looked you in the eye and told you a mistruth. We call that something else in my family, but because just approximately 26, 26 months later, during the beginning of COVID, you voted again. Maybe led by Gary, I'm not so quite sure. But this time, it was a 100% fee increase. Yes, it was just the beginning of the Wuhan flu, and you were gentle to us. You only charged us 50% the first year, and then 25% jumps the next two years. So now to this date, this date today, the basic owner's fees have doubled, and another 25% to follow next year. Gary told the city council mistruth. It was not a one-time fee increase. Now, I actually wonder what they tell you in your planning committees. Is the airport still running deficits with all this brand new income you guys, you've got? Is Allegiant taking a break? Or are they, you know, are they just taking a break or are they leaving us after now all your freebies have been handed out? Is now the right time to deny airport land leases to people that have money and pay on time you are planning on tearing down approximately 27 hangars of people that have just raised their rates 100%. They're all paying. How much is that going to cost people of Ogden with these brand new hangars they're putting up that aren't going to be full? These hangars are full right now. So remember, a hangar is just a shed for an airplane. Also, those hangars' carbon footprints have already been spent, and that is until Bryant fires up his bulldozers. Who's going to take care of the airline's ground equipment? after Bryant bulldozes my shop. See, Ogden can't even find a security agent for the nighttime watch. And who's gonna take care of this? The ice equipment, you know? Those airlines, I had Wuhan flu. I was in the back of that de-ice equipment trying to get the airline off the ground when I was sick. Who's gonna replace that? You guys thinking ahead? Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, anyone else in person could address the council? Okay, we'll go to the hands online, uh, starting with Carrie Wayne. Hello, this is Carrie Wayne, your neighbor from Mary Slaterville. Um, I was just checking in um, to see if uh, Mayor uh, Van Leeuwen had sent a letter. Again, he's asked for a timetable for resolution on some of the items that we brought before you. I know that I've been here several times, again, asking you to set forth a timetable uh, because we've had nothing settled so far. Uh, again, we had the high winds, uh, which did damage a vehicle over here on the 1200 West. Um, that's been forwarded to Boyer, I believe. Um, we put up a, a silt fence after a year of construction, they put up a silt fence and it's been up for about a week. It's, someone's already drove through it already. Um, again, we, we had a deer kill this morning uh, from the Nature Center. Uh, there's just things that need to be taken care of. That's all we're asking. Uh, we've been very patient. Again, we've come up on the anniversary of the construction. 
I wrote to you about the mosquitoes over here because of the standing water that Boyer's left for almost six months. Uh, they filled in, when they put in their cell fence, the water is, there's so much water over here, they actually sunk their post hole digger out in front of my house. So we, all we're asking is that you guys treat us fairly. Uh, I, I see you bending over the backwards for, for the people on Porter, and I, I sympathize with them. They have no idea what we've been through, but I, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And again, I, I, I I need you to do the right thing. On the mosquitoes, uh, the abatement people will not fire up until May. Uh, it's not our fault that uh, that they've appeared. It's Boyer's fault. But again, it's coming from your property, your property that you need to manage. And it's not Boyer's. It, you know, the, the bottom line, it, it falls with you and we need you to do something about it. Again, the, they, they've listed several things that Boyer hasn't done for us, uh, that we've been telling you all along that Boyer hasn't done for us. Uh, need you to do something. We really do. It, it's 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 getting very frustrating for everyone along here. Uh, like I said, I, I talk to my neighbors; they break out into tears because of the fact that it, it's changed their lives so dramatically. Uh, the home that they had in their dreams is now gone. And uh, again, you you just can't sit by with your hands folded and and say it's just too bad. Uh, we need you to step up and, and take care of this. Thanks again. Thanks, Carrie. Hopefully you'll hang online with us tonight and keep watching. We'll, we've got at least a couple more comments to gather and then we'll go through and adjust, uh, respond to the notes that we're making, okay? Next on the list is Daniel Matthews. Daniel, you there? I am, good evening, uh, Chairman. I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, I do have a, a couple of things I'd like to bring up, uh, mainly uh, pertaining to the earlier work session. We had the opportunity on February 20th to hold our Ogden Bazaar. By the way, I'm sorry, Daniel Matthews, 25th and Jackson. I also work with uh, Indy Ogden. But we had the opportunity to uh, do our Bazaar Market, which is 80 plus vendors. I think the, the count Michaela had at the Marshall White Center was close to 800 people came through that day. And it was a marvelous, these are marvelous opportunities. We have another one going on this Sunday. I really encourage um, everybody to come out and kind of see what we have going on there. But we have people who literally will travel to that market. Some of our vendors are from Salt Lake. Some of our participants are from Salt Lake. We had people who came up as far uh, from Provo. So if you have something cool going on, <laughs> people will show up. Uh, council member Hire, we're talking two blocks, two blocks away from where you are sitting now, two blocks away from where 7,500 people come for an amphitheater concert. How many come for all of these other events? I really don't want to, and I think the citizens of Ogden don't want to hear this argument that putting a world-class recreation facility in the Marshall White footprint is somehow not going to benefit all of Ogden. The amazing rec center that's over at the Ben Lomond facility. I, I'm just curious if public funds were put into that and how much discussion happened along the lines of how that rec center was going to benefit the people of Inner Ogden. But the, I've had the opportunity to either virtually or in person attend these sort of city council meetings for, for a while now. And I wish, like, the insight and the, the enlightenment that I've been able to gain and one thing that I do want to take back and talk to the people at the Marshall White Center, huge shout out to Todd and Ed for like doing whatever they can with what they have at that facility. But while you guys are making jokes about <laughs> like I couldn't believe it, like golf simulators and stuff like that, you have people in this community who don't have access to something that is desperately needed. The reason why a lot of the people who are new to Ogden who sit on that council have only recognized the, the Marshall White Center as a community center is because of the systematic neglect that the city of Ogden has paid to that building. And the, the enlightenment I wish I had, now I can just go back to these people and say, hey, at least we're not married at Slaterville. I mean, like the city needs to start listening to the taxpayers and constituents versus developers. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Daniel.
Okay, next on the list is Angel Castillo. Thank you. Good evening, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. I'm going to piggyback just a little bit on uh, the comments about the Marshall White Center. I, too, have been listening to the work sessions. Um, and I'd just like to lift up a comment that Chair Nadolsky made about the center, you know, more so along the lines of, we're going to do it here and then where? Because there's clearly a need. And the discussion that happened before that and after that sounded a whole lot like when a homeowner picks up a picks out kitchen cabinet handles before the house is designed. You have to commit to you're going to do the thing on the footprint and then the discussion of how big is it and how big can we go and do that and then address the need afterwards. And everything else is programming. And everything that and programming is something that you, uh, the administration really wanted to bring in the YMCA to do that. and. The YMCA wasn't going to build just a rec center. They were going to build all of the things. Um, and on the uh, police salary increases, I'm, I'm really glad to see that because I have been coming before you since 2018 petitioning for better wages for officers that were losing officers. And you're all going to have to step up your game when the new budget comes because uh, a friend of mine actually sent me a post today from Jordan Gustin uh, with the Boise Police Department, and it says, to my Utah law enforcement friends and those interested in law enforcement, next week I'll be making a trip back to the Beehive State for a recruiting visit to answer any questions about making the transition from Utah to Idaho as a police officer. This isn't anything new. It's been happening for a while. I've been talking about it since 2018. It's really imperative that you dig deep and make sure that our first respond responders are fully funded, otherwise we're going to continue to lose them. And it's a, kind of a zero-sum game because we invest so much money in them because they're really good. They're wonderful. We need to keep them. And I'd also like to lift up uh, Council Member Chaburka's comment um, of why she voted no with community outreach. Uh, we don't do a really great job at it, and that isn't that the folks that are doing the outreach are doing a bad job. It's just there's no real intentionality and no real financial commitment to make sure that our citizens are fully pursued with intention to get them to participate. Uh, you know, we just kind of throw a wing and a prayer at it and run some studies and post some things on Facebook, whereas we should be really examining and deeply engaging how we can make sure that folks understand what code is, and how it impacts them. And we should definitely start working with Weber Heritage to find out how we're going to preserve and continue to grow at the same time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Angel. Anybody else care to address the council? Hi, Travis Pate, uh, 2546 Jefferson. I primarily want to just, uh, one of the addresses with the Merritt Slaterville thing, it's now been a month since he was last here. If any of you have not driven out there, I would encourage you possibly to do so as a council. Um, I reported a broken light on our street five, over five years ago. It was repaired last spring. So I said, please give priority to them. Um, when Nye's Corner was rezoned in Roy, uh, they didn't, it wasn't required by any obligation to notify Ogden City because it was not within the boundaries. Our fortunately, our statute says, anyone within 300 feet, whether in, the pro whether in the city or out of the city. So fortunately, we've addressed that, and I think we addressed it because of what happened to us near the airport 45, 50 years ago, because Roy could rezone and do whatever they wanted to, because it was Roy. It was not contiguous, to, uh, it was contiguous to our property, but they only had, their, had to act within own, their own interests. And so I believe they now also have said, okay, anybody noticing outside here, we're gonna share notifications. And so I think just that how we treat our neighbors is also how we possibly maybe expect to be <laughs> doing to others as you expect them to do unto you, I guess. <laughs> and so I try to show a little more respect that way. Uh, as far as the frustration earlier, uh, the dynamic was I paid at the recorder's office and I left. There was no dialogue saying, hey, this is it. Because I said if it's the wrong forum or format, then I would get I, the attorneys, I said, please process the client, please, please process it. Greg says, well, it's here on my desk. It's paper clipped. Come get it. 
And I said, Greg, I'd prefer that you process it if it's not the right format, because it is a decision by the Planning Commission, which then does go, it says the Planning Commission or the Mayor make a decision, it can go to the Board of Zoning Adjustments, which that's what I did. It, this body is legislative, so yes, now it would go across the street to the courthouse. But that petition is legitimate for when it was filed and who it was filed against and by, by Cindy Toon and myself. It wasn't Mr. Pate, and I didn't demand, demand, demand three times that I, that I was falsely accused of that. I said, Greg, I'd prefer that you process it. Mr. Stratford, you, Mr. Stratford and I had already discussed this, um, and he said he will look into it, but just go ahead and process it. So even Mr. Stratford did it. So when you guys turn to Greg and ask questions, no, the legal counsel's there. Greg's not the lawyer. And so practicing law without a license and, and saying, no, just take it for advice. No, for the time that was, the, that was filed correctly. And if not, then it would, should be from the attorney's office. They sent a letter and here's a refund check. And at this point, please, here's, here's your next course of action. So where, when it was filed and where it was filed was correct. There was no discussion with the recorder. So for him to make an accusation and, and say, oh, the recorder's backed me on me. And again, it goes back to the, the, the browbeating. And, and we're paying, the taxpayers are paying his salary to browbeat citizens and to practice law without a license. And so the dynamic is, what do we do? And so I'm, I'm simply saying it was filed correctly. And so the advice in there, it goes the Adams Avenue plan. And then also the aspect the buildings are being built for a residential grade, not a commercial grade. So no handicap accessibility, no fireproofing for commercial structures, no distance from the proper zones because di zoning differences, commercial has to be. Thanks, Travis. Feet, so. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else? Okay. We'll start at the top. We'll start with mayor's comments. Um, hopefully, I think, hopefully you guys are taking some notes too. We've got some things We're up. certainly taking notes and we appreciate okay. all the public comments and um, we will look into all of that. Um, the comment that we just kind of fly on a wing and a prayer is completely inaccurate and uh, offensive to the people that work so hard to work through these things. So I'll, I'll push back on that a little bit and uh, other than that, we appreciate everybody being here and, and what we're doing. We're going into budget season, and it's going to be tough, and we're going to have some of these difficult conversations, and I appreciate you all being willing to have those. So thank you very much, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thanks. Council members, comments? Jerry, I have, mm -hmm. I have a comment. And um, so I... I a lot of activity has been happening, and I'm really disheartened um, from the standpoint of what's happening in Florida and in Texas. And I'm, I'm going to just, I, I, if anybody's been following, I am going to say the word gay because it's okay to say gay. Um, apparently, it's not in Florida. But I want people to know that Ogden's a welcoming city, that we are here, that if, if anybody has um, I mean, we are the third or fourth highest suicide rate, teen suicide rate, and a lot of those kids are LGBTQ. And I want um, them to know if they need to reach out um, that, that I will listen to them and get them the right, to the right place. Um, it's just really disheartening to see what's happening um, in our country right now and the divisiveness that at a time when we really need to be coming together internationally. And so I just hope, and, and, I, and I thank you all sitting up here for supporting me and, and, um, and I would hope that if any of those kids ever came to you guys that you would lend a, a, a listening ear as well. So thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Marcia, for sharing that. Anyone else? I just want to add my voice of support to Councilmember White's comments. I, I think it's important to say it out loud and that I thank you for what you said, Councilmember White, and uh, that I, uh, that you, you have my full support and the LGBTQ community has my full support as well for being an inclusive uh, community to them. So thank you for your words. 
Others? Chair, I, this is somewhat petty compared to, <laughs> to Marsha's uh, comment, but um, th there's been a few times I've been called out for representing my constituents, and I'm not sure why it, it's, it should be, I should feel ashamed for representing legitimate points of view that are in our city and concerned, but I'm not ashamed. I think that those points of view need to be voiced and I'm gonna to continue to do so. If it makes people offended, I am sorry for that. I think you need to look inward. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, what you shared, you can share from a perspective I can't. And so I appreciate that you did share it and I want you to know that I support you and I love you for that. And that uh, I'm, the stuff that's going on in the nation, I, it is disheartening because people are a lot more valuable than right or left. Um, and I, I, I commend this council for seeing past left and right. I think we, we see through that and we see people. And so if there is ever anybody out there that's listening to this that is thinking of hurting themselves, um, I hope that we do share a message of love and that they know that we all are lock and step in making sure that they feel loved and that they can be everything that they are unabashedly. So thanks for sharing that message tonight. Just a couple items. Um, I had a conversation with a, I guess a constituent or stakeholder at the airport recently and, um, I don't, I don't think we need to get into the details of what was shared tonight. I just wanted to say that personally, I'm at a point where I'm like, I don't know what to do to make it better. It's, we're put in this position to, to choose sides all the time. And um, it's just, it's exhausting and confusing and dizzying, frankly. And so whatever, I don't know what can be done at the airport to resolve differences, but I guess answering them back and forth in a legislative setting just isn't it. I mean, like nothing I can say here tonight or any of us are gonna say um, is gonna make that tension go away. So whatever can be done, I'm sure there are a lot of people doing everything they can, but um, I'm frankly just kind of exhausted by being stuck in the middle by it. Um, I guess similarly, uh, Carrie Wayne, thank you for He's still online, I think, um, for continuing to come and come kindly. Uh, I, you don't have to share it tonight, Mayor, but uh, a few weeks ago you shared in an email that you'd, you'd passed it along to the engineering division for, kind of for them to look into and, and reach some resolutions. So if, if it's okay with you, I'd love to hear an update from them on how that's going. Um, if there's nothing more that can be done and that's what their answer is, that's what their answer is. But um, I, I do think we owe it to, to Carrie and the other neighbors just to make sure that we're um, clearly communicating that out, out in the open. So um, I guess for Travis's comments and questions, um, I, don't, I don't see Greg, but I wouldn't reach to Greg for any legal defense, that's for sure. But uh, Gary, is there anything discussed tonight that that we asked of Greg on procedure um, that was that needs clarifying or expanding on. I don't think so. The board of zoning adjustment doesn't have any it doesn't have any jurisdiction at all over a recommendation for a legislative act, and so I'm sure that Greg talked to Mark Stratford about it, and that was the advice, and, and that's what he passed on. So including it, not just tonight, but at the time that this was submitted. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Or er, thank you. Gary, Gary's proven to be quite a talented attorney. Appreciate you. Okay, um, that wraps up Mayor Council comments. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Council Member Heyer, second by Council Member Blair to adjourn. This is a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are adjourned. Let me know when you're ready for the RDA. Okay, are you good? We're paid by the hour. We're good. <laughs>
<laughs> Is that how? No, we're not. No. No. Okay. <laughs> I already made a change Good. tonight. Okay. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the special redevelopment agency meeting of March 15th, 2022. Let the roll call reflect that all board members are present. First item on the agenda is approval of minutes. Councilmember Blair, the regular meeting of July 13th, 2021. Uh, yes, uh, Chair, I have reviewed those minutes and found them to be accurate. And I would make a motion that we adopt the regular, the minutes of the regular meeting of July 13th, 2021. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Blair, or sorry, Board Member Blair, second by Board Member Chaburka to adopt the minutes as presented. This is a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Okay, let's bring up Jeremy Smith for reports from administration on proposed land transfer, 2300 Quincy Avenue, infill. <coughs> Welcome back, neighbor. Thanks, great to be back. Um, today we're gonna be talking about uh, the 2300 Quincy Avenue infill project and your role, what we'll be asking for you today. This is a, a property we started acquiring our properties for this project about 10 or 11 years ago. Um, over the past few years, we've purchased the remaining pieces we need to actually do this infill project. And so, um, what it will entail is two of the parcels are actually owned by the RDA. The remaining ones are owned by Ogden City. So um, this is a small infill project, um, but we need them all to be owned by Ogden City to move forward with the actual project. Um, and so that's what you're voting on today. Uh, previously, you voted on an approved CIP funds to actually develop the, the public infrastructure in this project. That was in uh, fiscal year 21. And it also, um, this type of project was approved under the small subdivision, or excuse me, the quality neighborhood initiative as a small subdivision. Um, just to give you a little background on the project, um, this is a, it is a small little infill pocket subdivision. It's large enough that it accommodate eight uh, single family homes. And we would be, the city would be the developer and um, working with a contractor to build those homes. We would, but would remain or retain ownership of the project. Um, architecture would reflect the surrounding historic neighborhood and we're currently looking at uh, wrapping into that architecture some ADU ready spaces in they're built into the home. So the homeowner could come in if they choose to uh, develop those and make them ADU units. Um, we're working through some conceptuals on that currently. We also um, have a goal to use water-wise landscaping um, to be implemented in each of these properties. And um, this property is a little unique in that it currently includes one historic home already that the city or the RDA owns and would be um, restored back to uh, or has, have a historic restoration on it and then sold. Um, so that's the background. Um, these are the two parcels that need to be transferred. If you were to look at the plat overhead, there's one that has the existing home on it above and then there's just a smaller piece below, but both of those would need to be transferred to Ogden City. And just to give you a little um, overall concept of where this lays in the city, this is an aerial and showing some of the surrounding work we've been done, have done in this neighborhood. Um, this is really one of our target streets. We've done a lot of, a lot of um, renovations. The green circles there are homes that we purchased and renovated and sold to owner occupants. Uh, we've also done, it looks like a help loan on that same street. And uh, just, we're just west of the Oak Den subdivision also. So. And then you can see the blue dot um, to the west side where it says future infill is the location of this subdivision that we're talking about now. And this gives you just kind of a street view of what that property looks like with the existing home adjacent to it. And that's all I have today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this time. Thanks, Jeremy. Questions? Sure, I have a question. Yeah. So these two properties, were they purchased with the quality neighborhoods funds or how where, where did the money come from to pay yeah, for the RDA properties is that we're talking about yeah, yeah. these two yeah, yep. that would have been part of that okay so and I guess the other when when those when those, these properties are sold where will that money go back to if it's prorated back to that um, no that once they're transferred if they're transferred to Ogden City 
So most of it would be developed, and you know, if there's profits to be um, put back, it would just go back into the the housing fund that we have. Just go into uh, that. Okay. Yeah. That's why I was curious. Okay. All right. Good question. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks. Okay. There's no more questions or comments from the board. We'll entertain action. Oh, I will. Chair, I'd make a motion then that we adopt uh, proposed resolution 2022-1. Second. We have a motion by board member Heyer, second by board member Blair to adopt proposed resolution 2022-1. This is a roll call vote. Council member Blair. Aye. Council member Chiburka. Aye. Council member Heyer. Board member Heyer, aye. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. It's just, it's just in. Board member Hire. It's just. <laughs> Aye. Board member Ritchie. Aye. Board member White. Aye. Vice Chair Lopez. Aye. Chair Nadolsky. Aye. That passes, and it's good to know you're human. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Public comments. This is an opportunity to address the board regarding any concerns or ideas on any topic. Welcome back. Travis Pete, address on file. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, uh, particularly neighborhood development and then also just the transfer that I saw. The historic home, as I kept driving by that Quincy property, I'm like, please don't tear it down, please don't tear it down, please don't tear it down, and it stayed. And so I, I've kind of watched. My sister actually had the good fortune to live in the apartments that were behind there and also the good fortune to be gone before they turned into an inferno. And so I don't know if any of you know about the infill block behind there that there was quite a large, quite dense apartment complex uh, directly below the Golden Links Tower. And uh, it, was, it was horrendous. I don't believe there were any lives lost, fortunately, uh, but it was just, and so to actually see the, the neighborhood and the densities come, come, into that, come into that aspect, I just wish the same thing could have been done on our block on the, on the, 2700, the 2600 block of Jefferson. The, the warranty Wattis family home was there and the city gave permission, just came in, tore it down, built the townhomes. And whereas possibly developing and designing around a, a, a key feature. And so I think that's the same thing. I, I, when I was asking about some of the design patterns and everything else, we've already gone along Porter Avenue. We're slowly inching our way towards 25th Street. So I think to me, when something comes in and says, yes, it's, it's planning and we have to possibly act on it because the petitioner did, uh, the same thing, I, it should be to me, I say neighborhood development, independent of us, do you have thoughts for this plan or property and, and what can go on Porter Avenue? When you look at those one and a half story <laughs> working class homes and you say we're going to replace an infill with $300,000, $385,000 row houses, does it match the neighborhood? Does it complement the neighborhood? And so the proposal I gave to you still stands. So if the right of way and some of these other aspects don't go forward, I would encourage you to simply say, let's look at RDA and look at infill and building around the historic flair of the neighborhood. And then I'm sorry, I was just tempered. I, I, we all see so get, everyone get, has that opportunity. Um, but I'd cautiously look at any, the, the current development, <laughs> even though it's not RDA, Fire code for commercial, make sure that that's okay with the fire marshal because I believe the current townhomes are built residential. So if we don't have an ordinance for live work, then we probably ought to address that before we build any more. So, okay. Thanks, Travis. Just so you know, I still love you. No worries. I still have a picture of you trolling in the D for the. the <laughs> Sorry, Travis and I go back to college. So. <laughs> Back when I lived in, back when I lived in the basement of the church, the, the Catholic church on campus. So, okay, good to know you two are also human, and we love you for it. Okay, um, comments from the executive director. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Reminder, members online. Okay, Angel Castillo. Sorry, Angel. No worries. Uh, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that make Ogden really special. Uh, it's warm and friendly people, uh, fantastic little independent villages, businesses that are restaurants and things like that. And one of the things that, in my mind, stands at the forefront is our historic homes. Our historic homes make us 
different than everybody else. It's the reason we love 25th Street. It's the reason we want to preserve it. And, and everybody understands that we do need progress and we need to grow, but we continue to, we should hold on to that heritage because it's really, really, really important. And I'm very pleased that, uh, as uh, Travis was, that the historic home for the 2300 Quincy Avenue infill was kept. That was a great thing. What I would like for you all to consider as you move forward is how are we going to do things differently with regards to this opportunity that we have with the infill project? Eight homes right there. We're going to be doing exactly the same thing. I mean, the, the Quality Neighborhoods program is amazing and the Own and Ogden program is amazing. I mean, we do some really, really great things to try to help folks, but we have to adjust this model because we cannot continue to address the housing need by continuing to build larger single family homes. And there's an opportunity here to do something different. On the East Bench, there are these adorable little uh, cottages that are set up together that are much smaller than a standard single family home. And they meet historic character and they keep the feel of a single family neighborhood. We need to start thinking about things like that, about adjusting our code to allow smaller units and then putting in some guardrails and if it's in a historic neighborhood, that it's really got to match what's going on if it's seen from the streets or, or, or from the neighbors. It's an important thing to do because we have a wasted opportunity if you're just going to put eight homes there that are not going to be affordable. By the time they're built, they're going to exceed that HUD uh, repurpose uh, amount that Ward Ogden requested. Their, their people aren't going to be able to really afford them. And we're talking about the whole, you know, working class, teachers, fire, police, that kind of thing. So please consider as you move forward to next year that you're going to look at codes and you're going to make those adjustments or you're going to hire, put aside some money to hire some people to make those adjustments because we're doing exactly the same thing, expecting to get a different result, and it's just not happening. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Next on the list is Heath Sato. Hi, guys. Heath Sato, Ogden resident. Um, I just wanted to know, as the RDA, has any progress been made on uh, creating extra guardrails uh, for an administration that believes that anything that is legal is not unethical. Um, the, the brown ice cream building thing, you know, I've been harping on it forever and everybody's sick of hearing about it, but the administration went to your lawyers and asked if they could legally, after, after the agreement had expired, they asked if they could legally, um, go ahead and sell the building without mentioning it to you guys and they apparently said yes and very clearly told none of you <laughs> none of you knew about it until the developer spoke up himself and uh to try to defend himself um and that's just wrong i mean it's an administration that is hiding things from the rda after they had already misled you guys, I, I I don't see how any of this is acceptable. And if they will not act ethically, then you're going to have to put up more guardrails. <sighs> My main worry is that none of this is going to be able to be changed until this administration is out of there. Um, and that's just sad for Ogden because there's a lot of development happening, a lot of movement happening. And... We have an administration that's not honest with you, doesn't respect you, doesn't show you the respect you deserve. You put in so much work for the small amount you're paid and you're being informed by people that are paid ridiculous amounts of money, upwards of $200,000 a year to get things right and to tell you the truth. And that's just not happening. Um, and I'm tired of watching it happen. Um, good luck guys. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Thanks. Thanks, Heath. Anyone else? Okay, comments from board uh, Sorry, comments from executive director. 
I have nothing to add at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Comments from board members. Okay. I'll consider a motion on a closed executive session. Chair, I would move that we uh, adjourn into a closed executive session for one of the seven items listed in the in the agenda. Second. Okay. I have a motion by board member Hire, second by board member Blair to convene in a closed executive session for one of the item reasons listed on the agenda. This is a voice vote. It's a roll call vote. Or, sorry, this is a roll call vote. Thanks. That's what I meant. Council member Chaburka. I board member Chaburka. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I board member Hire. I I'm sorry. I flustered you earlier. <laughs> board member Richie. Hi. Board member White. Aye. Board member Blair. Aye. Vice Chair Lopez. Aye. Chair Nadolsky. Aye. That passes. We will adjourn into a closed executive session. Just as a note to the public, we will adjourn from this meeting from within that closed session. So this is the last you'll see of us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.